Hello and welcome to CIA Files, true stories of U.S. intelligence. I have no idea why I said it like that. Oh, you're working on your transatlantic accent. I don't know. I think I started maybe instinctively to go British, and then I decided in that same second not to do it, and then I was just kind of left. In the middle, uh, in the transatlantic. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You're right. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, anyway, this is CIA Files, True Stories, U.S. Intelligence. I'm Topher M. Ford. Uh, Got Brandon here with me. Brandon, how you doing? Ah, doing pretty well. I've got my own little co-host here. It's a a gray kitty named Lucy Fur. I've seen Lucy Fur. She is a sweetheart. (laughs) Uh, I have a kitty, too, named Schmitty. Schmitty kitty. Schmitty kitty. He's not in here with me. Uh, he's probably sleeping somewhere. He, so what are people going to learn about today? Oh, 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 we have returned to complete the story of one of my personal favorites, Harold Kim Philby. Uh, if you remember, we covered him um, a while back, a few episodes ago. We did his origin story. Yeah, he was an interesting but, fellow. Like, and his father is an interesting fellow, too. I can't wait to yes, eventually uh, do an episode on him. Sinjin Philby, yeah. And, um, yeah, but today we get to learn about all of the, you know, the, the juiciest bits of what he did. Well, he's while... like the most successful, like, spy in history, is he not? I mean, isn't I think he so. considered, I mean, like... Yes, like KGB agent is the head of MI6 and DC and stuff. Yeah, he was running uh, counterintelligence, you know, for Britain while actually working for the Soviets. Yeah, I'm not an expert on spies. I don't know every spy in history. Don't tell people that. (laughs) 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 You're going to lose street cred. Oh, I, yeah, but I can't, I can't deal with the possibility of someone like calling me out and then for getting something wrong and saying, you're supposed to be an expert. And then I have to defend myself. I'm no, I'm learning this shit as we go along, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's been fun, but yeah, as far as I can tell, I don't know of another spy that's been that, you know, was able to operate for as long as he was because from what I can tell so far, uh, spies have a relatively short shelf life. You know, it's difficult to, to pass, you know, sabotage your, uh, the efforts of the people you're supposedly working for and get to keep that up for a long time. Eventually people figure things out. Uh, but he was able to operate as a spy for a long time. And yeah, he was running counterintelligence. Uh, so he was like he was the, the head one, spy he was the guy in charge of finding himself. Yeah. And became got very close to becoming the head of MI6 altogether. Um, but his, uh, he, you know, his. Well, let's not give too much of it away. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. All right, well then, uh, let's get into it. Here is uh, part two of uh, Harold Kim Philby. We are not professing to tell you the complete story of these activities. We are professing to tell you the complete story that we know. These records that we've uncovered don't tell the story. This is CIA Files. They tell pieces of it. True stories of U.S. intelligence. Oh, that was all schoolboy nonsense. He's a reformed character now. St. John Philby. I am haunted and burdened by what I know of official secrets, especially by the content of high-level Anglo-American conversations. The British government whom I have served have betrayed the realm to Americans. I wish to enable my beloved country to escape from the snare which faithless politicians have set. I have decided that I could discharge my duty to country only through prompt disclosure of this material to Stalin. Donald McLean 
Kim Philby had been casting about for an invitation into British intelligence when fellow Trinity College alum Guy Burgess introduced him to Marjorie Maxey, head of MI6's propaganda school. The three met to discuss Philby's potential employment with MI6. Philby described their meeting in his book, My Silent War. I found myself in the forecourt of St. Ermin's Hotel near St. James Park Station, talking to Miss Marjorie Maxey. She was an intensely likable elderly lady, then almost as old as I am now. I had no idea then, as I have no idea now, what her precise position in government was. But she spoke with authority and was evidently in a position at least to recommend me for some interesting employment. At our second meeting, she turned up accompanied by Guy Burgess, who I knew well. I was put through my paces again. Encouraged by Guy's presence, I began to show off, name-dropping shamelessly as one does in interviews. From time to time, my interlocutors exchanged glances. Guy would nod gravely and approvingly. It turned out that I was wasting my time, since a decision had already been taken. Before we parted, Miss Maxey informed me that, if I agreed, I should sever my connection with the Times and report for duty to Guy Burgess at an address in Caxton Street in the same block as the St. Ermans Hotel. I decided that it was my duty to profit from the experiences of the only Secret Service man of my acquaintance, so I spent the weekend drinking with Guy Burgess. On the following Monday, I reported to him formally. We both had slight headaches. Philby's primary concern in the beginning was to stop the growing threat of fascism. And so, Kim Philby worked for MI6 in the fight against the Nazis, rooting out German spies within the British establishment. He was posted in counterintelligence, working to uncover Nazi spies. As he did all of this, he also passed British intelligence on Axis enemies along to Moscow. During this time, Stalin repeatedly asked Philby for reports on British activity focused on Russia. Philby told the KGB that Great Britain was too preoccupied with their mutual enemies to be concerned with Moscow. Stalin naturally found this hard to believe. But while there were people within the British establishment who were generally uneasy with the existence of a communist government, the overall consensus was that, philosophical considerations aside, they were allies, and resources spent on surveilling the Russians were resources not spent on fighting the Nazis. So in those early days, it could be argued that while Philby was working covertly with the foreign government without the knowledge of his own government, his actions weren't treasonous, at least in spirit. His compatriots in MI5, however, would have likely contested this argument. Philby's secret was threatened almost immediately after he joined MI6, when a Soviet intelligence officer named Walter Kravitsky defected to the West. Kravitsky had been a dedicated servant of communism in the years leading up to the war, but he became worried when Stalin began killing Soviet agents during the Great Purge. His friend and fellow intelligence officer, Ignaz Rice, notified Moscow that he was defecting in 1937 and was in turn assassinated that year. So Kravitsky fled, first to Paris, then to America, where he began giving testimony about Russia's intelligence activities. Philby watched, helpless, as Kravitsky passed along information about a number of Russian spies. But while Kravitsky said there were Russian spies within British intelligence, he didn't have enough information to identify them. He debriefed MI5's Jane Archer, claiming that there were 61 Soviet spies working in Great Britain. He didn't know their names, but did describe one as a journalist who had worked for a British newspaper reporting on the Spanish Civil War. He also described other members of the Cambridge Five, but MI5 were suspicious of his motives and his claims went uninvestigated. Kravitsky returned to the States to give more testimony but he was found dead in a hotel room, seemingly at his own hands. He was discovered holding a gun, a single shot in his head, and three suicide notes nearby. However, his death was actually carried out by the Russian NKVD, who staged the scene to look like a suicide. Philby worked at first in Section 5, conducting counterintelligence work in the Iberian Peninsula, primarily Spain and Portugal. 
While not his first choice for an assignment, it at least got Philby within the halls of British intelligence. His Russian masters, however, wanted him to get inside Section 9, the section devoted to Russian affairs. Philby decided to make a play for Section 9 director, a job that by all rights should have gone to his boss in Section 5, Felix Cowgill. Philby worked quietly behind the scenes, subtly sowing discontent between Cowgill and his subordinates. Philby undermined Cowgill in the eyes of his superiors as well, dropping small hints of Cowgill's inability to lead the section. Philby's efforts succeeded, and he was promoted to chief of Section 9. Upon learning this news, Cowgill resigned in anger, as Philby knew he would. Once in charge of Section 9, Philby was perfectly positioned to stop any plans by Great Britain to undermine or attack Russia. It was one of the biggest intelligence achievements in history. In 1944, Philby faced another threat to his cover when a Russian man named Konstantin Volkov walked into the British embassy in Turkey. Konstantin Volkov was the Soviet vice consul in Istanbul. It's like a diplomatic post. One fine day, he showed up at the British embassy requesting his counterpart. They sat down for a meeting in which Konstantin said he was an NKVD agent and he and his wife wished to defect. They would do so in exchange for passage to Cyprus for and 27,500 British pounds. Also, he would hand over information on a large number of Soviet agents in England. One was the head of a counterintelligence department in Britain, and others working in the foreign office. He insisted that his offer must not be communicated over cables. You know, the Soviets were listening to those, and they had three weeks to reply. The offer was sent by courier to the head of what is now MI6, who then gave it to the head of the Russian section, Kim Philby who just so happened to be one of the spies Volkov was going to out. Philby informed his Soviet handlers, and then he took his sweet, precious time getting to Istanbul. By the time he got there, Volkov had already been disappeared. MI6 Director Stuart Menzies passed Volkov's report on to Philby, who was horrified by its contents. He advised that MI6 give him time to investigate Volkov's background before bringing him in. Philby also insisted that he himself be the one to travel to Turkey to retrieve the man and his wife. Menzies agreed with Philby's recommendations, and Philby was tasked with bringing in the defector. But Philby dragged his feet, taking several days' worth of preparations before leaving. He, of course, also tipped off Moscow to Volkov's intentions. By the time Philby arrived in Istanbul, Volkov was nowhere to be found. Calls placed to the Russian embassy there proved futile. Philby successfully stalled Volkov's defection, effectively signing the man's death warrant, along with that of his wife and extended family. Ben McIntyre described Volkov's fate in A Spy Among Friends. Konstantin Volkov left no traces, no photograph, no file in the Russian archives, no evidence about whether his motives were mercenary, personal, or ideological. Neither his family nor that of his wife have ever emerged from the darkness of Stalin's state. He had been right to assume that his relatives were doomed. Volkov was not merely liquidated, he was expunged. Philby showed no sympathy for Volkov, describing him as a nasty piece of work who deserved what he got. Philby would barely be clear of Volkov before another Russian defector would threaten his position, Igor Guzenko. In 1945, Guzenko was a cipher clerk at the Soviet embassy in Ottawa. He and his wife were allowed to live in the community. He apparently liked it because when he was told he'd be transferred back to Russia, he left the embassy with a briefcase full of codes. 
he had a bit of trouble defecting. Uh, he was afraid to go to the Royal Canadian Mountain Police because even though he knew that his office did not have any agents there, he was afraid the NKVD might. So he went to the local newspaper. The night editor at the newspaper didn't want the responsibility. So then he went to the Department of Justice. But they had no duty officer working at the time. Uh, so he went to his neighbor's house. He and his wife hid. And good thing for them because Soviet agents did pay his apartment a visit, becoming suspicious of him. The next day, he, ma he did turn himself into the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, didn't want to take him in. He didn't want to upset the Soviets, who were technically allies. However, Mackenzie King's Under Secretary of Affairs approved the defection, believing Gozinko and his family's life to be in danger. Gozinko was sent to the infamous Camp Z, spy training camp and all. Through Gazinko's defection, the reality that the Soviets were spying on Canadian citizens came to light. This led to many investigations and counterintelligence measures and the outing of many spies. It embarrassed Russia greatly, and had Gozinko not defected, they likely would have had many more months, if not years, to operate with impunity. Philby could do nothing to prevent this, but he did pass along to Moscow all of the information that Guzinko gave to the Canadians. He was concerned that Guzinko might also reveal information about the Cambridge spies, himself included. Philby was often in a state of near panic during his time in British intelligence, especially at moments like these. Ben McIntyre wrote, He waited anxiously for the results of Guzinko's debriefing. Philby may have contemplated defection to the Soviet Union. The defector exposed a major spy network in Canada and revealed that the Soviets had obtained information about the atomic bomb project from a spy working at the Anglo-Canadian Nuclear Research Laboratory in Montreal. Somewhere in the midst of all this, Philby began dating a woman named Eileen Furse, whom he met through a mutual friend, Flora Solomon. Kim and Eileen had their first child in 1941. By the time they married, in 1946, Eileen was pregnant with their fourth. Although Philby didn't know at the time, Eileen suffered from Munchausen syndrome and would often injure herself for attention. Philby's emotional detachment, coupled with his secret dealings and likely infidelity, contributed greatly to her mental decline over the years. Munchausen syndrome. It was named after Baron Munchausen, who told wild stories. In this case, the stories are illnesses. Someone with this disorder will pretend to have health problems they don't have. They, they fake pains and injuries and, and so on. Uh, they may even try to get sick. In Munchausen, by proxy, they will claim that their child is sick. In extreme cases, they may even poison their child so that they do get sick. The reasons for it are not really known. Generally, it's seen as a form of attention-seeking. Uh, some people who have the disorder did go through a major illness in childhood, so it may be a way of creating or recreating the feelings of being cared for. In 1949, Philby was appointed as the liaison between MI6 and Washington, D.C. He and his family moved into a modest but nice home in D.C., where Philby would often throw raucous, drunken parties. Almost every key figure within the CIA, as well as from the FBI and other government agencies, would attend these parties, including Alan Dulles, Frank Wisner, and Walter Bedell Smith. Philby also cultivated and exploited his close relationship with Jim Angleton. The two met once a week for lunch at a restaurant named Harvey's, where they would get sloshed on booze and stuffed full of steak and lobster, and classified information flowed as freely as the alcohol. One CIA officer, Miles Copeland, said, What Philby provided was feedback about the CIA's reactions. They could accurately determine whether or not reports fed to the CIA were believed or not. What it comes to is that when you look at the whole period, 
from 1944 to 1951, the entire Western intelligence effort, which was pretty big, was what you might call minus advantage. We'd have been better off doing nothing. With this open access to sensitive information, Philby managed to sabotage early paramilitary efforts by MI6 and the CIA to undermine communist control in Eastern Europe. The first of these efforts to fail, thanks to Philby, was Operation Valuable. Before World War II, Albania was the poorest nation in Europe and a feudal society. 1% of the people owned 95% of the land. And the rest either worked for or owed allegiance to them. During the war, Albania was split across a variety of factions. Monarchist, fascist, traditionalist, republicans, and communist all slugged it out. During the war, communist partisans came out on top. After a communist takeover of the country, many of the fascists and monarchists fled. The CIA and MI6 thought they should recruit amongst those who had fled and train them as special forces. Operation Valuable was to drop these soldiers, pixies, into Albania and ignite an insurrection against the communist government. Hopefully, other anti-communist insurrections would start in the region and Soviet politics would be thrown into turmoil. Philby relayed all of the mission details to Moscow, and as a result, the Pixies were always found and imprisoned, or more often executed, soon after their arrival. In many cases, before they were killed, the captured Pixies were forced to radio back to their Western handlers that all was proceeding as planned, and they should send more weapons and money. Soon after arriving in D.C., Philby also learned about a massive intelligence operation that was being conducted by the FBI, Project Verona. Project Verona was an American cryptography mission to decode messages to and from Soviet spies in the U.S. In the 40s, a team of male and female cryptographers made major breakthroughs in cracking the code. Up to half the codes were deciphered in 1944, then Bill Wiseman, a Soviet agent working in the Army sig- U.S. Army Signal Corps, informed Soviet intelligence of the project's existence. The Soviets stepped up their game, and the codes were again harder to break. Nonetheless, a lot of traffic was uncovered, revealing that the Soviets were spying on the Manhattan Project and that Soviet spies were working in the U.S. Treasury, the State Department, and OSS. Numerous spies and informants were identified, including an aide to President Roosevelt, um, Alger Hiss, and the Rosenbergs. Philby spent much of his time quietly observing the code breakers at work. He also made a habit of dropping by the CIA offices, usually just in time to grab a drink somewhere nearby. He and his colleagues in U.S. intelligence would drunkenly talk shop into the wee hours of the night, then wake up the next morning and go to work. And then Philby's old chum and fellow Soviet spy, Guy Burgess, arrived in D.C. Burgess moved to Washington after he was given the posting of first secretary at the British Embassy in D.C. Despite Eileen's ardent protests, Philby let Burgess move into the basement of their home, further stressing their already tenuous marriage. Burgess initially asked if he could stay at their home for just a few nights, but those nights, as often was the case with Burgess, languished into months. This friendship between Philby and Burgess, along with Philby's persistent apologies for Burgess's drunken behavior, proved to be a massive liability further down the road. While Philby worked in D.C., MI6 Director Stuart Menzies decided to launch an investigation into his past as Philby was being considered to take over as Chief Director. In doing so, details of Philby's past, once overlooked, now drew suspicion as these details roughly matched the description of a Russian mole given by Kravitsky and Gazinko. 
but they didn't recall Philby back from America. And then something happened that set in motion the beginning of the end for the Cambridge Five. Project Verona uncovered a Russian spy codenamed Homer, who was actually Donald McLean, another member of the Cambridge spy ring. Much like the other Cambridge Five, he was from the British elite and educated at Cambridge. His father was a member of parliament. Despite this background, he was quite the communist. He was recruited by the NKVD in 1934. He goes on to become a career diplomat. He worked in London, assigned to the Western Department that dealt with the League of Nations. He was transferred to Paris and promoted to third secretary of His Majesty's Embassy. When the Germans invaded, he was moved back to London and worked on matters of economic warfare. He was promoted and transferred to Washington, D.C. during the last year of the war, where he worked as first secretary. In 1948, he was promoted yet again, transferred to Cairo, and made head of chancery at the embassy there. The entire time, he's feeding the Soviets information on diplomatic cables, like before the war, British plans towards Germany, uh, British-French plans to intervene in the Winter War. He had access to the cables from the head of the foreign office in London to the British ambassador in D.C., and he forwarded those cables to the Soviets. His trajectory was stopped by the work of U.S. cryptographers who figured out he had to have been an agent while in the U.S., Apparently, the case was pretty solid, and he wasn't going to be able to talk his way out of it. Philby learned that MI6 was closing in on McLean and sent Burgess back to London to warn him. But before Burgess left, Philby stressed to him, Don't go with him when he goes. If you do, that will be the end of me. Swear that you won't. But Burgess did flee with McLean. The decision was made by their Soviet handler, Yuri Motor. He later explained, The center had concluded that we had not one, but two burnt-out agents on our hands. Burgess had lost most of his former value to us. Even if he retained his job, he could never again feed intelligence to the KGB as he had done before. He was finished. Both Guy Burgess and Donald McLean were members of the elite, highly educated, and they were violently intelligent. They came from the same intellectual circle as Kim Philby. They also both had serious problems with alcohol abuse and enjoyed sex with random male strangers. And they both ended up working in the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. McLean was the first secretary at the embassy there, and in the capacity, was able to send his Soviet handlers vast amounts of communication. He worked in D.C. from 1944 to 48. Some sensitive information he knew about came to light. The FBI suspected McLean was the source, but after following him around, they thought perhaps he was being blackmailed to the drinking and, and homosexuality they discovered, but they could not find evidence he was a spy. Burgess was the local head of MI6 in D.C. in 1950 and 51. I mean, he had access to Korean War plans and shared them with the Soviets. Now, his drinking was becoming a problem at work. He got like three speeding tickets in one day, and I guess that was the, the last straw. So he was ordered back to London. At this time... Project Verona discovered the existence of a spy at the British Embassy, someone who had been there in the late 40s, and then suspicion fell on McLean. Philby thought McLean would talk if arrested, so arranged for him to defect to Moscow. Philby reached out to Burgess to assist, who was, you know, in the process of, of probably being fired. Burgess was not supposed to defect. Uh, he was only supposed to assist. Um, he shouldn't defect, or you know, Philby didn't want him to defect because, well, Burgess could still continue in his role. He had not been outed. He was not under suspicion. But if both of Philby's friends defected, then 
Philby would, would look pretty look pretty suspicious himself. But Burgess did, in fact, defect. At first, the government tried to pretend nothing was happening, but eventually admitted that they had defected. The extent of their spying was discovered. The biggest hit was probably to U.S. and British relations. The U.S. lost a lot of faith in their British counterparts. I mean, come on. The head of MI6 in D.C. was a Soviet agent. Officials wanted to know who tipped off McLean, and Philby was the most obvious suspect, just as he'd warned Burgess he would be. He was then recalled to London, and CIA Director Walter Bedell Smith ordered reports from anyone within the CIA who might have had contact with him. After reviewing the evidence, CIA officer William K. Harvey declared that he was convinced that Philby was a Soviet spy. The typically paranoid Jim Angleton refused to accept the possibility that the man who taught him everything he knew could be working with the Russians. He was convinced that Philby's mistake was trusting his friend, Guy Burgess, who Angleton believed had duped Philby along with everyone else. Back in London, Philby was interviewed by MI5 counterintelligence chief Dick White. Philby filled White in on Burgess's unscrupulous past, trying to persuade White that Burgess couldn't possibly be a Soviet spy, considering his outrageous behavior and lack of decorum. Of McLean, he claimed complete ignorance, falsely stating that he'd never met the man. Many people within MI6, as well as within MI5, believed that Kim Philby was a spy, although they couldn't prove it. However, Philby had the support of a man named Nicholas Elliott, one of Philby's closest friends and a fellow MI6 officer. He, like Angleton, believed that Philby's worst sin was in associating with known ne'er-do-well Guy Burgess. Elliot lashed out at anyone who dared accuse Philby within his earshot. To Elliot, Philby was not only someone he trusted completely, but also someone who embodied totally the ideals and values of the West, and someone who was wholly convinced of the evils of Stalin and of communism. But McLean's protests were not able to save his friend's position within MI6. Walter Bedell Smith wrote to MI6 head Stuart Menzies, informing him that the CIA believed Philby to be a spy, and that the CIA would sever relations with MI6 if Philby continued to work for them. Dick White also urged Menzies to take immediate action. Menzies was left with no choice but to let Philby go, whether he himself believed the charges or not. Helenus Milmo a lawyer who worked with MI5 interrogated Philby for four hours. Afterward, he reported, I find myself unable to avoid the conclusion that Philby is and has been for many years a Soviet agent. There's no hope of a confession, but he's as guilty as hell. Philby's wife Eileen, already stressed nearly to her breaking point, also believed the accusations. From a spy among friends, Eileen knew that her husband had lied to her, consistently and coldly, from the moment they first met, and throughout their marriage. The knowledge of his duplicity tipped her into a psychological abyss from which she would never fully emerge. Philby spent the next few years working at a private company in London. Then, in 1955, a Major General, Sir John Sinclair, told Dick White that he believed Philby had been the victim of a terrible injustice. Philby was called back to MI6 to be interviewed again and was subsequently invited to come back to work. After the New York Times reported this fact, thanks to a leak by J. Edgar Hoover, many public officials became furious. But they were shouted down by Philby's ardent supporters. Philby decided to hold a press conference in his mother's apartment in an effort to address people's suspicions. Ben McIntyre described the meeting in A Spy Among Friends. What followed was a dramatic tour de force, a display of cool public dishonesty that few politicians or lawyers could match. There was no trace of a stammer, no hint of nerves or embarrassment. 
Philby looked the world in the eye with a steady gaze and lied his head off. Philby denied he was a spy. He added that, I have never been a communist and the last time I spoke to a communist knowing he was one was in 1934. The Soviet intelligence officer, Yuri Modin, who was based in London, watched the press conference on the evening television news. He described his performance as breathtaking. He later recalled, Kim played his cards with consummate cunning. We concluded, just as he had, that the British government had no serious evidence against him. Philby returned to work for MI6, although this time as an agent rather than an officer. He was no longer included in the executive functions of the organization. Nicholas Elliott sent Philby to Beirut to work as a journalist for The Observer and The Economist. When Philby moved to Beirut, he did so without his wife or children. Eileen's close friend, Flora Solomon, wrote to Philby, accusing him of abandoning his wife. He replied harshly, saying he wouldn't be sending money to his wife unless she provided receipts for the household bills and declared that he was fed up with her idleness. Soon after arriving at his new posting, Philby began a love affair with Eleanor Brewer, the wife of a journalist with the New York Times. In December of 1957, Eileen Philby was found dead in her bedroom. The coroner listed the cause of death as heart failure brought on by a number of contributing factors, including her alcoholism. Flora Solomon bitterly blamed Philby for her death. Eileen's psychiatrist believed Kim might have murdered her because she possibly knew too much. When Philby received word of his wife's death, he was ecstatic. He celebrated it loudly at a bar in Beirut, showing the telegram with the news to anyone who'd look. His only misgiving was the notion that he'd somehow been involved with her death. After Eileen's death, Eleanor Brewer filed for divorce, and she and Philby married in 1959. In 1961, a KGB agent named Anatoly Golitsyn defected to the CIA. He gave information to the CIA and to MI5 that implicated Philby as a Soviet spy. Around the same time, Flora Solomon, who already disliked Philby immensely, became disturbed by the articles Philby was writing about the Middle East. She wrote in her book, Baku to Baker Street. The dispatches he sent from the Middle East to the Observer were causing me distress. Anyone with eyes could see they were permeated with an anti-Israel bias. They accepted the Soviet view of Middle East politics. The thought occurred to me that Philby had, after all, remained a communist, notwithstanding his ascent in the Foreign Service and his clearance by MI5 of possible complicity in the Burgess-McLean scandal. Israel was a newly minted country, with the Arab-Israeli War happening in 48. In the 50s, you have this wave of Jewish immigration into Israel. There are many Holocaust survivors and others fleeing anti-Semitic violence as well as those who wanted to support the establishment of Israel. Um, they were like tent cities for the new arrivals. It was a um, you know, pretty, pretty big deal. Now, the Palestinians, they were none too pleased with this situation, and there was a lot of uh, tit-for-tat violence. Palestinian Fedayeen would attack civilians, and Israeli militia or soldiers would retaliate. So with this in mind, tensions were high. Now, of note overall to our subject matter, um, you know, being political intrigue, is that the Palestinian Fatwa Party was secular and socialist-leaning. And Israel was working to counter its power and influence, unfortunately by clandestinely supporting what becomes Hamas, the Soviets tend not to like nationalistic or religious parties preferring secular and socialist parties. Also, throughout the Arab world, you have um, the rise of the Ba'ath Party, and which is a socialist party itself. And so Soviet sympathy will probably naturally have leaned over toward um, the Arabs. Back in the 1930s, when the two were still close friends, Philby had told Solomon that he was working with the Russians via Comintern. 
He then asked if she'd join him in helping the Russians pursue peace before the war broke out. She'd declined and hadn't given it much thought since then. But after Eileen's death, for which Solomon blamed Kim, and after his reporting and commentary on the state of Israel, she began to express her feelings toward him more openly. One night, Solomon ran into banking heir Victor Rothschild at a social function. The two eventually began discussing Philby, and she mentioned his past, saying to Rothschild, How is it that the observer uses a man like Kim? Don't they know he's a communist? Rothschild thought this information was important enough to share with British intelligence, and so he introduced her to Arthur Martin, a counterintelligence officer with MI5. Solomon was reluctant to speak on the matter officially, worried about possible retribution from Philby or from Soviet agents. Even so, she recounted her story about Philby's communist past, his admission to her, and his attempt to recruit her to work for the Soviets. Martin, who had believed Philby was the spy who'd tipped off McLean and Burgess from the beginning, was set to interrogate Philby. But at the last minute, it was decided that Philby's close friend Nicholas Elliott would confront Philby instead. Elliott had experienced a change of heart regarding his friend's loyalty to the Crown and to Western values after hearing Flora Solomon's testimony. Now angry over his betrayal, Elliot insisted on being the person to confront Philby. Martin, along with the rest of MI5, found this decision appalling. Martin had been doggedly pursuing Philby ever since the defections of Burgess and McLean and was understandably displeased to have his opportunity to see his case through to the end snatched from him by Philby's most ardent defender at the last moment. Elliot met Philby in a small room in Beirut where he interviewed his old friend for four hours. Elliot recorded their conversation, but he also opened the window to the street, which produced enough noise to drown out much of their conversation. Philby did confess, but with a highly edited version of the truth. He said he'd stopped spying for the Soviets when the war ended. He said he'd recruited Burgess and McLean back in 1934, and he'd only tipped off McLean in 1951 as a courtesy of friendship. Elliot wanted to believe Philby, but he couldn't avoid the fact that Philby was quite obviously omitting key information. Elliot promised his friend full immunity from prosecution if he'd give them the whole story. Elliot even went so far as to say that he believed Philby had stopped working for the Russians in 1949, and he knew that Philby had eventually realized that Stalin was really as monstrous as the West believed him to be. Despite this, Philby decided that the risk of arrest was too imminent, and so on January 23, 1963, he fled to Moscow. Many people felt that he was likely allowed to escape, perhaps as a favor between old friends, or perhaps as a way to avoid a public trial that might bring to light inconvenient information. Desmond Bristow, MI6's chief in Spain at the time, said, Philby was allowed to escape. Perhaps he was even encouraged. To have him brought back to England and convicted as a traitor would have been even more embarrassing. And when they convicted him, could they really have hanged him? In Moscow, he was received as a national hero. He was given a comfortable apartment, a salary, and was allowed to enter a sort of retirement. He would occasionally advise the Soviet government on dealing with the West, and he often gave talks at colleges about how those in the West think and operate, and how he was able to fool them for so long. Harold Kim Philby died in Russia on May 11, 1988. He was given a grand funeral and hailed as a hero of communism and of Russia. Before his death, Philby expressed his feelings toward the people he betrayed. Friendship is the most important thing of all. I have always operated on two levels, a personal level and a political one. When the two have come into conflict, I have had to put politics first. The conflict can be very painful. I don't like deceiving people, especially friends, and contrary to what others think, I feel very badly about it. Kim's granddaughter, Charlotte, would visit him in Moscow as a child. 
She would later say of her grandfather, One thing I have gleaned from my conversations I've had with my own father and others who knew Kim is that for good or bad he was a proud man and one who chose to publicly stand by his actions. While he made a choice that few, if any, can really claim to fully understand, and one which had dire consequences for the friends and colleagues he betrayed, Kim was prepared to face the repercussions of what he did, either because he felt that it was the right thing to do, or because it was about saving face. Either way, I'm not sure that it matters. Whether, when at the end of it all, he sat back and reflected on the choices he'd made during his life, he did feel any doubt about the decisions he had made, we will never know. But one thing is for sure. He would never have asked for absolution. So I should never expect that on his behalf. All right. Well, yeah. That's uh, that's the life of uh, Kim Philby. Uh, I, th- I think crazy. I think it's a lesson in um, failing upwards. It was like nothing he could do. And, you know, we learn about his friends, too, that like, elite crowd (laughs) it's it's almost as if they're yelling hey we're not only like in like in many ways incompetent unstable people um we're we're wherever we go information gets leaked but they don't get caught they get promoted (laughs) yeah it's like well that was is a testament to um well what when we come back to guy burgess he talked about how he and his cambridge five friends were able to get away with these things because of uh what he called uh class blinkers you know the the you know because they all came from the certain background uh with their you know their their heritage and they all went to these distinguished british established places like eton and uh, cambridge and whatnot and they knew all the right people and related to all the right people that no one in british society could even fathom that they weren't to be trusted well Just and even when the evidence was overwhelming yeah well and also the society's geared to help those people get away with crimes you know like if if they were you know embezzling funds or something or doing something that wasn't treason um, i'm sure their friends would have tried to help them not face any consequences whatsoever i mean that's just kind of that circle I mean, and, yeah. and, you know, I guess it's really any circle. Anybody's going to try to help their their friends avoid consequences, or it's just kind of a common thing, uh, right? Yeah, you know, if you've got a small group of elite people, then they're going to help each other, cover up for each other, and try to keep each other out of out of jail, even uh, if it's treason. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, even if it's treason. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's not but, it's not treason if my friends are doing it. I, I, is it? <laughs> that's is a, that... I think that's that's a line that seems to be coming about now. Um, I disagree with that, but yeah, it's like uh, uh, mental gymnastics. People do mental gymnastics to justify well, what I'm doing really isn't against the state or against the Constitution. I'm, I'm actually trying to protect it and make things better. It's like, uh, really? Right. <laughs> Is that and what you were doing? There was also the issue, I think, of pride, where a lot of the people who were pulled in by Kim Philby, because he was very um, charming. He was, you know, oh, what's that actor's name? Hugh Grant. He was, like, charmingly befuddled all the time. <laughs> and, you know, uh, someone was like, I say, old boy, it looks as if you'd been working for the Soviets this whole time. And he's just like, oh, oh, well, I'm so charmingly befuddled. (laughs) And they're like, oh, well, never mind. You're so charming. (laughs) Well, they, um, well, I'd read that part of um, Putin's rise early on was to make people think he was incompetent. And that allowed him to get promoted 
because people, you know, the, those in power were not afraid of him. They believed he incompetent. He, he was seemed incompetent. safe. Yeah. Um, but then once he got into his, his fingers in a pie, <laughs> in a pies, then he was able to, you know, actually take the power. So. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of um, people say that about British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, that, you know, he, the this whole, like, competent doofus thing he has going on is a total play is a total act you know yeah i'm sure that played a part of it with kim philby but yeah i think also because he was so charming people loved him and they were charmed by him and uh and instinctively trusted him and so they didn't want to admit once it became painfully obvious that he was a spy they didn't want to admit that they had been fooled. I definitely think that that was what happened with Jim Angleton. Uh, of course, in Angleton's defense, you know, they were like really close friends. And Philby, I think, really did a number on Angleton, uh, which made Philby a good spy. That's part of why he was able to do what he did for so long is because he was able to cultivate and exploit friendships with people. Um, but Aww. I think those people didn't <laughs> want to admit that they had been fooled. It's like that. It's like that. Um, the ex that <laughs> you don't want to admit that you've made a mistake or you're, you're dating someone. You're like, uh, everybody's like, you know, you know, he's, you know, you know she's no good or something. And like, oh, no, 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 no. You don't understand. No, she's, she's uh, great. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that, that's her cousin that she's hanging out with. Uh, she's not <laughs> cheating on me with that's another that. country. <laughs> no, it's the cousin that comes to town every, every once, every so often. And, you know, they, they have to go spend a three day weekend together. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah, that was Kim Philby. And we will be back soon. We're going to cover Guy Burgess. Uh, we got a little mention of him in this episode as you know this raucous partier who kind of shows up and blows things up wherever he goes as far as you know wild characters in this whole story go he is probably the wildest of the uh cambridge five i've heard him referred to as uh, the hot mess of the cambridge five (laughs) (laughs) right which they were all a hot mess. So oh, you that guy had to be lava. <laughs> we'll see. I really like uh, learning about Guy Burgess, and he might be my favorite of the Cambridge Five. Um, we'll see. We'll see. But anyway, thanks for listening. Um, of course, you know, check out the socials. Buy our swag, Threadless oh, backslash yes. CIA files. Um, yeah threadless.com slash cia files facebook facebook.com slash cia files uh, twitter and instagram at cia files podcast and the website cia files.net again thanks for listening and we will uh we'll be back soon over and out